So if you can open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27, you can find it on page 884. We'll be reading from verse 32 through to verse 56. Matthew 27, starting at verse 32. So Jesus has just been put on trial. They've condemned him to death and they are now leading him out to the place where he would be crucified. As they were going out, they found a Cyrenian man named Simon. They forced him to carry his cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave him wine mixed with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. After crucifying him, they divided his clothes by casting lots. Then they sat down and were guarding him there. Above his head, they put the charge against him in writing, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two criminals were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, the scribes and the elders mocked him and said, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, even the criminals who were crucified with him taunted him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God. Why have you abandoned me? Then some of those standing there heard this and said, He's calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and offered it to, offered it to him a dr- for, for a drink. But the rest said, Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Suddenly, The curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And they came out of their tombs after his resurrection, entered the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray as we come to think about what Matthew has just told us in his gospel. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the chance to remember again what you have done for us in your Son. Give us ears to hear hearts to understand, and the will to put into practice what you'll have to teach us this morning. Amen. It's a strange occurrence to be here at church on a Friday. Usually it only happens once a year, sometimes twice a year if Christmas falls on a Friday. But this is a particularly important day. It's a day we get to remember what God has done for us. Good Friday isn't necessarily about learning new things about what God has done, but being reminded again what he has done. It's a fantastic time to reflect on a story that we've heard countless times. Think about it. When was the last time you read the Easter story? Probably last Easter and the Easter before that and the Easter before that. But if you're anything like me, 12 months between readings isn't enough time to actually remember what's going on. And so it's a good thing that we get to do this every year to remind ourselves of all the things that we have forgotten and the things that God still wants us to learn. 
This is the height of Matthew's gospel. This is the moment he's been building up to since the beginning as he wrote his story about Jesus' life. Throughout his gospel, throughout his account of Jesus' life, Matthew has been giving us broad sweeps of time. Sometime weeks or months pass between chapters and verses. But here in this chapter, time slows down. We are given a minute-by-minute account of exactly what's going on. Matthew doesn't want to spare us any of the details so that we can see what God is trying to say in this momentous event. The first thing that jumped out at me as I was reading this, and maybe it jumped out at you too, is the repeated question from the crowds, if you are the Son of God, come down. First, it comes from the crowds in verse 40. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Then in verses 41, 42, the chief priests and the elders join in on the act. Why doesn't he save himself? He said he was the Son of God. This is one of a couple of big questions Matthew has been preparing us to ask. Is Jesus really the Son of God? You see, the last time this question was asked of Jesus like this was all the way back in chapter 4, and the person who asked it was the devil. If you are the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. Every time Jesus hears this question, the temptation he faces is the same. Will he use his God-given power and authority for selfish gain Or will he submit to the will of his father and do what no man in history has done and follow God faithfully with everything he has? Every person since Adam and Eve has rejected God's will, has decided that we actually know better than God, that we can make better rules than he can. And here... Jesus is facing that same temptation. And the question is, will he give in? But here, Jesus shows us that he is the Son of God, the faithful one, not by coming down from the cross, by vindicating himself in front of everyone, but by staying and allowing himself to die so that he can die the death that his people deserved. You see, there's a problem with the world. Every time we reject God, every time we pretend that he doesn't exist, when we think that we can do a better God than job of making the rules, that's treason against the one who created us. The Bible's word for this is sin. And the punishment for sin and treason against God is death. And because we have sinned, someone must take that punishment. But here, in this moment on the cross, Jesus says, let me die instead of you. You deserve that punishment, but let me take it for you so that you can have the life that I have promised to give you. There's a cruel irony in the words of the mockers because Jesus is the true son of God and it is very well within his power to come down from the cross. He is the word that created the universe. One word, he would be down from the cross His enemies would be bowing before him and he would seem victorious. But he shows that he is God's true and faithful son, the righteous king, not because he comes down, but because he stays so that his people can live with him forever. And now Jesus gets a turn to speak. It's his turn to open his mouth. Will he silence the mockers 
Will he call down God's wrath on those trying to kill him? What will he say? In fact, he actually offers an explanation. He tells us what's going on. He reads the first line of Psalm 22, the hymn book that the people would have known. He says, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He quotes this line because he says, I want you to read the rest of that psalm. See what's going on in that psalm? That's what's happening right here. Because the funny thing about Psalm 22 is that it's not a psalm of defeat, but a psalm of victory. Yes, despite all circumstances, it looks like a defeat. It feels like a defeat. The psalmist feels like God has left him. But by the end of the psalm, he is praising God for his deliverance, rejoicing in what God has done for him. And Jesus is pointing to the psalm to say, it looks like defeat right now, but this is actually a victory. It looks like the world is ending, but in fact, it's starting again. The last words of Jesus are not a curse, not a condemnation of those who killed him, but a teaching moment to show us exactly what is going on, to say this may look like a defeat, but this is actually the first half of his coronation. That's why Pilate put the title above his head, the King of the Jews. This is Jesus coming to his throne. Humanly speaking, we see a man defeated, but heaven sees something different. Later on, right at the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, they'll describe this moment like this. John, the writer of the book of Revelation, is weeping because no one has found who is worthy to open the scroll that God has written. And yet all the people in heaven say of Jesus, you are worthy to take the scroll and open it because you were slaughtered. You redeemed a people for God by your blood. This is Jesus' moment of victory when death is defeated when the sins of his people are paid for, their punishment taken so that they can live forever with him. And if this wasn't enough, Matthew goes on and gives us even more description about what's going on. The sky goes dark. The curtain in the temple rips in half as the wrath of God comes pouring out on his chosen king. The earth is so repulsed by what is going on, it physically convulses. The rocks split and the dead come out of their tombs. Did you notice that in verse 52? The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. What's going on, Matthew? No one else talks about this. Why have you put this in here? He puts that there to give us a foretaste of what is coming, to show us exactly what Jesus' death has achieved. These people are raised because in Jesus' death, death has been defeated. It no longer holds sway over the world because the true and perfect son has died, because he has taken the punishment his people deserved, death no longer matters because his life is given as a gift to anyone who will trust in him. So the dead around Jerusalem are raised to show death is beaten, and we'll see even more of that in two days' time. And this is where we get to see the amazing wisdom of God on full display. He takes what looks like a moment of defeat and turns it into victory. He takes the epitome of human sinfulness and rebellion 
the murder of God the Son. And instead of using that to bring condemnation on the entire world, he says, this is the very moment that will bring you salvation. If you trust in this king and let his death stand for yours, you will live forever with him. No one else can take such a moment of rebellion and make it the very thing that brings us back to the God who we so often rebel against. This is the coronation of God's chosen king that will be completed on Sunday. And if Jesus is king, we need to act like it. We can't keep ignoring him, pretending that what he says doesn't matter. He's the king. Have a think about it. When was the last time you tried to ignore what your boss told you to do because you couldn't be bothered doing it? That's a great way to get fired. If you obey the laws of the land only when it's convenient, you only end up getting arrested. If someone, if Jesus really is king, then we need to listen to him, no matter what he tells us. We can't just choose the bits that we like. We don't get to decide that actually God doesn't get a say over this part of my life. We need to listen to everything he says. And for all of us, there are areas in our lives that we'd actually rather God stay out of. But it's up to us to trust that he knows best, that he is a true and good king, that he's not just trying to be a killjoy. In fact, what, do you, what is the first thing you normally do when you buy a new kitchen appliance, power tool or piece of heavy machinery? Normally the first thing you do is look at the manual and figure out how the thing works. I suggested this at a youth camp and they all laughed at me. They said, no, no, you just start playing with it. But normally you look at the manual because the person who made what you've just bought knows how it works best. They know how to use it safely. So if you read the manual, you learn how to get the most out of whatever you've just got. And they're not trying to do, the, they're not telling you how to use the device to ruin your fun or to limit you. They're trying to help you be safe and to use it properly. If you read in a chainsaw manual, do not try and stop the moving blade with your hand, you know they're trying to keep you safe rather than kill your fun. And here we see the creator of the world crowned as king. And if Jesus is the creator of the world, then surely he's the one who knows how to live life best. Because he's not the one, just the one who created life. He's the one who keeps it going. Every moment of every day, he is actively sustaining us and giving us life. And so when he tells us to do something, when he asks us to change, it's not to be a killjoy, it's not to be a dictator, but because he wants us to have the best life possible. A life of contentedness, of one that is at peace with our Creator. And so we should listen to Him. We don't get to pick and choose. He's the King. But He's the King who died for His people. The coronation of this King shows that power in God's kingdom doesn't come from brute force, doesn't come from influence or money but comes from service and sacrifice because that is the example the king has set for his people and he calls us to do the same. Throughout this chapter, Matthew has reached the high point of his gospel where he shows us, yes, Jesus is God's chosen king. Jesus is God's faithful son. And even in this last moment, he gives us all the evidence we need to see that this is true. 
So we're forced to ask, are you listening? The religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, they saw the same evidence and they ignored it. The soldier guarding the cross saw it and said, truly, this was the Son of God. The very thing that Matthew wants him to see, he saw. Are you ignoring the evidence? Have you let Jesus' death stand for your death? Will you let his life count as your life so that you could live as one of his people who will never truly die? When he comes again, he will raise all, not just the random tombs around Jerusalem, but everyone, so that those who have let his death count as their own, will be able to live with him forever. And it's an offer that he extends to everyone. Have you taken it? Will you take him up on this offer? Do you live with Jesus as your king, or do you just pretend that he is a nice guy? The cross shows us that Jesus is not just a nice guy, He's the one who created the world, dying so that those he created could live with him forever. This is why we reflect on the Easter story every year. This is the story that unites us, not just with each other, but with every Christian who is sitting in a church today, hearing the same story, remembering what their king has done for them. We all gather all around the world because our king died for us so that we could live for him and follow his example of service and sacrifice. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you most of all for your son. We thank you that he was truly faithful and that he died to take the death that we deserve. And we pray that as we go out today that you will enable us to live for you with Jesus as our king in every area of our lives so that we might proclaim what you have done to the world. Amen.